In this lecture, I would like to cover the structure of peripheral nerves and the brain. At the end of the lecture, I'd like to have some understanding of the structure of a peripheral nerve, of the basic histology of two very important components of the brain. I'm going to describe how nerve cells are supported by glial cells, and also how the brain and spinal cord is protected by the meninges. The main function of the nervous system is communication. And we have special sensory neurons that perceive information from the periphery, from our internal organs, and send that information into the brain to be processed. We have motor neurons that send information to our skeletal muscles and our smooth muscles to allow us to move as individuals and for some of our internal organs to change in dimension and therefore alter their function. All these important occurrences are happen as a result of the neurons in the nervous system. Let's now look at the structure of a peripheral nerve. Here is a diagram showing you a section through the spinal cord. The spinal cord is in the middle of the diagram. It has two components. One is coloured yellow, that's the outer white matter, and the internal butterfly or H-shaped structure is called the grey matter. Concentrate on the grey matter. It has two components. It has a ventral horn and a dorsal horn on either side. The ventral horn contains the cell body of a motor neuron that is going to pass out through the ventral root and form the spinal nerve. In the dorsal horn and in the dorsal root are axons projecting into the central nervous system from sensory neurons and the cell body of these sensory neurons are located in the dorsal root ganglion. Now that cell body also has an axon that projects out through the spinal nerve to the periphery and that axon receives information from the periphery, in this case about the pain after a finger prick, and that information is travelled from the area that's been pricked by the finger through the axon all the way up through the dorsal root, through the axons associated with this sensory neuron who again, as I'll mention again, the cell body is located in the dorsal root ganglion. So this is the basic structure of a spinal nerve. It consists of sensory axons carrying information into the spinal cord and motor neurons carrying information to skeletal muscles in the periphery. If we look across to the right hand side of the diagram, the other half of the spinal cord there represents the visceral components the visceral afferent sensory neurons and the visceral efferent motor neurons associated with the autonomic nervous system. Have a look at the tube drawn down the bottom. It represents perhaps the wall of the gut or maybe the wall of a blood vessel. But information is received from that structure that internal visceral organ and the information passes through the spinal nerve into the dorsal root and into the central nervous system. Again, the cell body of this visceral afferent sensory neuron is located in the dorsal root ganglion. All sensory neurons cell bodies are located in these dorsal root sensory ganglions, unless they're in cranial nerves. Now focus on the visceral motor components of the autonomic nervous system. 
and make sure you understand there are two neurons involved, whereas in the somatic motor to skeletal muscles, there was only the one neuron. The preganglionic neuron originates in the lateral horn of the spinal cord. That's where the preganglionic neuron cell body is located. And it then projects the axon out through the ventral root to then pass on to a ganglion. And then it synapses with the postganglionic neuron in that ganglion. And that postganglionic neuron then passes down, usually following blood vessels, to where those neurons are going to do their job, where they're going to stimulate smooth muscle, perhaps to contract around blood vessels or around parts of the gut. Now in this diagram, a sympathetic pathway is shown because the postganglionic cell bodies are located in here, they're, they're located in the prevertebral ganglion, but there is also the paravertebral, there is also the paravertebral ganglion also indicated. In sympathetic pathways, the postganglionic cell is always located in these two ganglion, either of these two ganglion, close to the spinal cord. If this was a representation of a parasympathetic pathway, the postganglionic fibre would not be located in these ganglia, but in ganglia way out in the periphery, next to the visceral organs to which they're going to send axons to innovate. And it's in those peripheral ganglia that the postganglionic fibre will originate and only travel a short distance to the site of which the activity is going to take place. So with that background knowledge about the structure of the spinal nerve and the axons it contains, let's now have a look at how the spinal nerve is structured. It's wrapped up by a number of connective tissue components. They are the epineurium, the perineurium, and the endoneurium. The epineurium is on the outside. The perineurium wraps around individual muscle bundles or nerve fascicles. Just like when you look at the structure of muscle, individual muscle bundles are wrapped up by perimysium. Within that nerve fascicle or nerve bundle are collections of axons and each of those axons are surrounded by the endoneurium. Here's a section of a nerve cut in low magnification on the left hand side and then at higher magnification on the right hand side. And I think it's important to know how to identify these coverings when you're really looking at a real section of the nerve. Again on the outside, this rather green stained component is the epineurium. And if you look within that, you can see a number of greenish bundles, circular profiles, they represent nerve bundles or nerve fascicles. And there are a number of them making up this peripheral nerve. Each of those nerve fascicles, remember, is surrounded by partly the epineurium, but also the perineurium. The perineurium divides these bundles into smaller components but also wraps up the outside of the bundle. And again, let me remind you that individual axons are wrapped up by the endoneurium. It's a bit hard to see that in this section at this magnification, but in the next section it will be more clearer. Here is an image of a nerve fascicle or nerve bundle at higher magnification. You can see on the very outside a bright green stained component, that's collagen. It's part of the epineurium 
that penetrates from the outer capsule wrapping around the whole nerve and dividing the nerve into nerve bundles or nerve fascicles, as you see here. Each nerve fascicle itself also has another connective tissue component called the perineurium, labelled here. It's a squamous type epithelial covering. It's a very important covering around the nerve bundle. It's a barrier. It protects the nerve fibres, the nerve axons. It's fluid filled. And this protection is very important to make sure that pathogens and other toxins, etc., don't have access to the very vital structures within the nerve fascicle, the nerve axons. And around each axon is the endoneurium. You can just see very small fibres, very small green stain components wrapping themselves around individual nerve axons. The axons shown here are represented by little dark dots and most of them have a white halo around them. That white halo is where myelin is usually. The myelin has been lost during processing of this tissue, so you don't see it. You just see the space where that myelin should be, the myelin sheath around axons. So have a look through this image and see if you can see little dots that represent the axons and the halo of white around those axons. You're looking there at myelinated axons. As we'll see later on, some of these axons are not myelinated at all. We call them unmyelinated axons. The other nuclei you see here are either Schwann cells or they could be the nuclei of endothelial cells belonging to capillaries. But most of the nice little circular ones you see in this section are the Schwann cells. They're the supporting cells of the peripheral nerve axons. They're the cells that lay down the myelin. Now, axons, as I mentioned earlier, can be myelinated or unmyelinated. Here is a high magnification image on the left hand side of a nerve that's been treated by a fixative where the myelin has been retained. And it, you can see the axon is a very clear structure and it's surrounded by a myelin sheath staining black here. And on the right hand side you can see the myelin sheath taken by an electron microscope viewing. It's made up of little lamellae or sheets and sheets of myelin. And on the right hand side of that, you can see an axon. And look very carefully inside the axon. You can see some little dots. Those little dots represent microtubules. The microtubules are very important for transport of substances, particularly neurotransmitters, up and down the nerve axon. And that large stained structure on the right hand side of the myelin sheath is the Schwann cell nucleus. Again, if you look very carefully at the image on the left, you can see some myelinated axons, but also you can see some that are not myelinated at all. And on the right hand side, you can see the nucleus of a Schwann cell. And you can see that the Schwann cell has wrapped up axons. And also you can see little tiny dots between these axons. That represents the collagen fibres of the endoneurium. So the Schwann cell does invest the axon, but it doesn't myelinate these axons. So in a peripheral nerve then, you have some axons that are myelinated and some that are not myelinated. And you would have also noticed that axons vary in their size, their diameter, and that often reflects their speed of conduction ability. Sometimes that myelin also, in fact not sometimes, when the myelin sheath wraps around these axons, the axon is myelinated by a whole large number of Schwann cells. 
So when you look right down the, the pathway of the axon, right down the length of the axon, they have myelin sheaths wrapping all the way around them. And there's gaps between these myelin sheaths. And those gaps are called the node of Ronvia. And they're very important because they allow the nerve impulse to jump from one node to another and speed up the rate of, of uh, impulse conduction. It's called saltatory conduction. Well, let's now look at supporting cells, the glial cells. Those cells that support the neurons and have a look at also their functions. We've learned already that ganglion cells are supported by satellite cells. Here you see ganglion cells in the top image. They're large cells, large neurons, and all the little nuclei around them are the satellite cells. We've also learnt in the previous couple of slides that nerve fibres are myelinated, and that's done by the Schwann cell. Well, there are other names for these supporting glial cells in other structures, such as the end plate, the gut, and in the retina. And we'll come across those special glial cells when we look at those tissues in more detail. But there's a Schwann cell nucleus shown in this section, and this Schwann cell nucleus is responsible for myelination in peripheral nerves. And there's the satellite nucleus wrapping around or being part of the supporting cells around the big stained or big um, ganglion cell you see in the top image. Well, let's look at these neuroglial cells in more detail. There are peripheral and central neuroglial cells. The peripheral ones, remember, are the Schwann cells or the satellite cells that I've already pointed out to you. One of the most important central neuroglial cells is the oligodendrocyte. It produces the myelin. So it's equivalent to the Schwann cell in the central nervous system. The Schwann cell is only responsible for myelination, remember, in the peripheral nerve. Now, they're quite easy to identify in sections. This happens to be a section through the grey matter of the spinal cord. Up the top left-hand side, you can see perhaps what is a ventral horn cell. It's shrunk away from the tissue a bit and there is a whitish halo around it. On the far right-hand corner, top right-hand corner, there is a space. That happens to be the central canal of the spinal cord and I'll refer to that in a moment. But have a look at the rest of the tissue. You can see some nuclei and they look different. They're a different shape and they're a different size. And this is the best way of identifying the different glial cells based on the shape of the nuclei and their size. For instance, the oligodendrocyte is a very small, round, dark stained nuclei. And you can see that labelled here. One point about the oligodendrocyte which makes it different to the Schwann cell, apart from its location, is that the oligodendrocyte actually can myelinate a number of axons, whereas the Schwann cell can only myelinate a single axon. Well, another very important glial cell is the astrocyte. It has a number of different jobs that I've listed there, on the slide, but most importantly, they form part of the blood-brain barrier. When I talked about epithelia, and I mentioned simple squamous epithelium forming a barrier, it does so in the brain. The very thin epithelial cells that make up the lining of these capillaries in the brain, the endothelium, have very tight junctions, and they prevent any materials going across into the neural tissues. It only allows glucose and oxygen to pass into that tissue and various other components that may be required. But these astrocytes actually help form that barrier by sending long projections up and encircling the capillary 
to almost be a double layer around these blood capillaries, therefore creating a component, a very important component of the blood-brain barrier. You can identify these cells because their nuclei are larger and often lighter staining, as you see here. Well, there is another important glial cell, and that is the microglial cell. They're like macrophages. They're phagocytic. And you can see them easily in sections because they have an elongated sausage-shaped nucleus. And finally, the remaining type of glial cell that I want to bring to your attention are the ependymal cells. These line the fluid-filled cavities in the brain, such as the ventricles and also the central space or central canal that I pointed out earlier. Well, let's move on and look at the brain. Only certain parts of the brain are going to be described. First of all, when we look at the brain, as we see in the left-hand image here, this is a part of the brain, or at least it's the brain that's been sectioned horizontally. You're looking at a horizontal section through the whole brain. Whereas on the right-hand side, you can see the brain that's been sectioned mid-sagittally. It's been cut down the centre. So you see the top part and the bottom part, and even part of the spinal cord. But what I want to bring to your attention is the grey matter of the brain is actually on the outside. Whereas remember, in the spinal cord, it was that H or butterfly-shaped structure on the inside, surrounded by white matter. In the brain, it's the other way around. The white matter is internal to the grey matter. Now, if you look very, very carefully in this section through the brain, the one that's taken horizontally, you can see some grey matter or greyish stain components within, embedded in the centre of the brain, embedded in the centre of the white matter. They are called nuclei. And this is a nucleus in the brain that's called the thalamus. Now, when we refer to the cerebral cortex and also the cerebellar cortex, we really mean the grey matter of the brain. There's the cerebral cortex shown on the right-hand side. It happens to be part of the frontal lobe of the brain. And there's the cerebellar cortex at the back or base part of the brain. They're two different components of the brain, two very important um, major regions of the brain. Notice the cerebral cortex is very folded, and so is the cerebellar cortex. It's a way of making sure there is a massive surface area for all the cortex to have many, many neurons that are going to perform very important functions. So then the grey matter is on the outside and the white matter is on the inside of the brain. And on the right-hand side, you can see a microscopic image of a region taken through the grey matter and the white matter or the cortex as well. Again, remind yourself that a nucleus is a mass of grey matter within the white matter of the brain. But now on the right-hand side of the cortex, now try and find a region that is grey matter. That region labelled there is on the edge of the brain's surface. The surface of the brain is that white, clear area in between that brain tissue. You're looking between one of these um, major convolutions or increased surface area regions of the brain. The white matter is internal, as I've emphasised a couple of times. So let's have a look inside that grey matter. Shown here on the left-hand side is the cortex, and the dark brown region is a layer of cells that are very important, a layer of neurons, and they're called the pyramidal cell. And they're cells within the grey matter that talk to the ventral horn cells in the spinal cord. They're the ones that initiate the ventral horn cells to bring about contraction of skeletal muscle. Neuropil refers to the part of the neural tissue 
that's occupied by unmyelinated axons, by dendrites, and by glial cells. So I just put that word up there just so that if you hear it again, or I mention it again in subsequent lectures, then it refers to those supporting components of nerve tissue, the glial cells, plus also dendrites and unmyelinated axons. The real focus is the main neuron, and in this case, it's the pyramidal cell. Well, there's the cerebral cortex taken in this mid-sagittal section. We looked at the section through one of those convolutions or one of those gyrus that they call the folded portions of the cerebral cortex. Now let's have a look at the cerebellar cortex. The cerebellar cortex is shown when viewed with a microscope on the right-hand side, stained to show the white matter and also the grey matter. The grey matter, remember, is on the outside of this very, very complex folded cortex. And if we look inside that grey matter under high magnification, we can see that within the grey matter, there are a number of layers of neurons. The cerebellar cortex is made up of three different layers of cells. And the most important one is the Purkinje layer in the centre. That Purkinje cell layer is a layer of cells that has an enormous dendritic branching pattern. It receives a lot of information from other parts of the brain and then sends its message via one axon further on. So they're just examples of some of the very complex neural components of the brain, the cerebral cortex and the cerebellar cortex. Let's now move on and look at the meninges of the brain and also the spinal cord. Here is a section on the left-hand side showing you um, a section through the skull, skin on the surface, the bone of the skull, and then underlying is connective tissue. The periosteum is the capsule that lines the surface of bones, and that's continuous with the outer layer or the outer meningeal layer of the brain, the dura. The dura mater is really almost part of the periosteum. It's the outside covering of the brain. And on the image on the right-hand side, this is a section through some neural tissue. It happens to be the optic tract, but it's a good section to illustrate these meningeal layers. And on the outside, this very thick connective tissue is the dura mater. Then you have the arachnoid layer. The arachnoid layer has peeled away from the surface of the dura here. And that surface of the dura between the arachnoid and the dura is often called the subdural layer. It's an artificial space. Underneath the arachnoid layer is the subarachnoid space. And then on the diagram, you can see that that's a fairly large space indeed. It's full of cerebrospinal fluid that circulates around the brain and keeps the brain protected and buoyant and also flows around the spinal cord. The subarachnoid space also houses some of the large vessels before they pass into the deep substance of the brain. And then the most internal covering around brain tissue is the pia mater. It forms almost an epithelial surface on the surface of the brain tissue and penetrates some distance into the neural tissue, particularly carrying very small blood vessels. Well, lastly, let's look at the ventricles of the brain. You know, the brain has big spaces in it, and these big spaces are occupied by cerebrospinal fluid. Here you see some ventricles one on the horizontal section through the brain you saw earlier, huge spaces between brain tissue. And on the right-hand side, you see it labelled in a histological section. The pink stained regions you see above and below the label are neural tissue. But in those ventricle spaces, you can just see some tissue evident. That's called the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus is an extension of the pier wrapping around 
groups of little blood capillaries. And that choroid plexus produces the cerebrospinal fluid. And as I said, it circulates in the subarachnoid space through all these ventricles along the spinal cord. And finally, it returns to the vascular system, to the venous system, through structures called arachnoid granulations. While under high power, on the right-hand side, you can see these choroid plexuses within the ventricle. And again, let remind you, they're just really extensions of the pier wrapping around very, very small groups of blood capillaries. And those epithelial cells that form the choroid plexus are responsible for making the cerebrospinal fluid. It's a very complex mechanism they use, and it's one that I, I won't explain now. So let's now summarise what we have just been looking at. Make sure you're aware of the structure of the peripheral nerve, its wrappings, its connective tissue coverings. Make sure you appreciate the complexity of both the cerebral cortex and the cerebellar cortex, the different cell layers. Make sure you know the different glial cells. Recognise them and know their functions. And finally, appreciate the coverings of the brain that protect the brain and the spinal cord, the dura, the arachnoid, and the pia. So thank you very much for listening to this lecture. I hope you've enjoyed learning something about the structure of the peripheral nerve and also a little brief overview of the histological structure of the brain. <laughs>